Hashtag first world problems. I yes, have too seriously. many books to read. I just don't have the time. <laughs> okay, we're live catching the end of our conversation <laughs> about what books we're reading currently because it's so nice outside right now that we're like talking about, ooh, after the live stream, we're going to go sit outside and do some reading. Yeah. So if you have any great book recommendations, go ahead and leave them in the chat. I'm yeah. sure somebody... <laughs> What's everybody reading? <laughs> That's very... That'd be very interesting to see. I always get, like, good good advice from people like that. Yes. Recommending books. Um, we are going to work on a painting of watermelon, and I do have reference photos, a pattern, and also some prep work on my blog, but we are actually going to do the entire thing here. I gave the prep work on my blog in case people want to uh, paint live. You just needed a little bit of... Um, a little bit of stuff done ahead of time uh, because of drying time issues. But we are going to do it together. Uh, this video is sponsored by jerrysartorama.com. I am using their Turner watercolors, uh, which are a very affordable um, line of watercolors, professional range. They're gorgeous and they're, they're a great buy. And I'm also using their Mimic uh, Faux Squirrel brushes. They're very absorbent. I really enjoy them. And um, I recommend the value set just because there's a great assortment. That's what I have and I never feel like I'm missing out on anything. I also have a scrubber brush here. Um, you can use Maxine's mop if you have it, but um, these new ones by Menta are great. They're hard to find because they are brand new, but they're by Royal and Langnickel. And um, they have a filbert uh, end, but they're really short and the bristles are golden taclon, but since they're so short, they're kind they're stiff enough that you can scrub with them. So um, either this or Maxine's mop and you're gonna be all set because we will need to soften some areas here or there. The other thing you're going to need, so grab it now if you're painting along, is some saran wrap, plastic wrap. Um, if you don't have plastic wrap, if you have like a plastic bag that's um, not the crispy type of plastic, but like the soft type of plastic, I don't know if that makes sense, you know, it doesn't crinkle when you mm. squinch it, um, like a dry cleaning bag or something, that would also work. You just need to cut a couple small pieces of it. Um, so I would recommend taping your paper down. This is, I'm just, um, I have my paper tape down that I'm going to work on for the majority of this tutorial, but um, I wanted to show you the plastic wrap technique on a separate piece of paper, just because of the, dr the drying time is so, uh, is so long. Uh, do you have anything to add, Sarah? Uh, questions about watercolors, type the word QUESTION in all caps, and then regular typing for a question, and either I'll read it out loud, or our mods, who are a wealth of information, will get the, your question as well. Excellent. All right, we're going to begin by wetting one of the slices, and you kind of want to do this one at a time, because um, you don't want, you want to get that saran wrap on it when it is at its juiciest, because that's going to give you the best results. So you do want to be careful when you're wetting it, or don't quite wet to the edges, so that you can go in with your um, with your paint. I'm using rose red, which is a, like a quinacridone rose. So any of like your, you can even use alizarin crimson would work really well. And I'm just going to go in and add some here. I don't want it to be like perfectly uniform. Got quite a bit on my brush there. So you want it to be kind of splotchy. Don't go right up to the uh, the rind though, because you usually have a white area there. And because the quinacridone red is a little bit, or the rose red is a little bit on the pink side, you want to grab some yellow ochre and just a little bit, not a lot. If you put too much, you're going to look like like it's a little spoiled. So you just want a little bit, so you you keep that fresh that fresh look. Then you'll want a paper towel just because you're going to want to kind of soften the area between where the red is and where the green's going to be. But you do want to put that green in while it's, um, while it's still wet so you get a soft blend. And I'm just going to do some savvy. And I'll just pull that color right out to the rind. And we will be going over the outside skin of it, but you do want that little bit of, of green that kind of um, kind of guiding into the flesh there. And then you need some saran wrap. And what I do is I just, um, by the way, I love these slide cutters. I don't know how many companies use them, but um, I know like huge roll from Sam's Club has it. And also the, well, this is the Walmart generic kind, um, but man, that's so much easier to, to work with. So I would just cut a small piece so that you don't get kind of out of hand with it. And I could even cut this down a little bit more. And another reason I want to cut it down is because you probably don't want to re reuse this because uh, you could end up getting paint in the background because uh, it's going to stay on that saran wrap. So I would just kind of get what you need so you don't waste a bunch. 
and you just kind of want to slide the saran wrap a little bit so you get that little bit of a texture in there. You can see that, if you can kind of see how the light reflects on there, that's those cells you're going to get. It's going to kind of look like an icy window pane. And we're going to repeat that for each of our slices. Now this one here, I do the back one first and um, either leave, I would go right up to those slices on the back one, but then when I print the, paint the forward slices, I would leave just a, just a scant uh, barrier of, of dry paper so it doesn't, they don't all bleed together. Do we have any questions yet? Is this confusing anybody? Uh, no, we're, we're caught up so far. Oh, good. Right, we have a couple people saying it seems kind of quiet. I don't know if your if your microphone's turned down. Uh, the mic's not turned down, but it's way over oh, okay. there. It's in a spot. Yeah, I might be able to move it. Actually, Sarah, could you unclip that? Maybe try to set sure. it maybe right there on the sure edge can. and bring it around. Oh god, I forget. I bought I bought these, and they have the deck like they look like they have pockets, yep. but they don't aren't actually pockets. Uh, and I didn't realize it till I got them home. Oh, uh, hate those. I like real pockets. Yeah, it's fine. All right. Let's see. Yeah, maybe that's a little bit. Let's I, see. I'm getting a better level reading on my. Um, okay, maybe that's. We'll leave it right there and see how that works. Okay, I'll try to speak up too. Sorry about that, guys. And you can also control your your uh, volume on the YouTube player. There's a little slider at the bottom of the screen, and that's separate from your your speakers. So uh, make sure you have both of those turned up. And again, same technique. I've wet the entire like semicircle of this watermelon slice. I'm just dabbing in my color because I don't want it to be completely consistent. I want it to be kind of modeled because watermelon have that modeled look to the flesh. You might need to add a little more water to your paint if it doesn't want to move at all. But try not to make it too consistent. You want to have a little bit of randomness. And remember, we're working really wet here, so you're going to have a greater shift when it dries than you would if it was, um, if it was, you know, on dry paper. And then a little bit of the yellow ochre, just to warm it up in places. And then I like to blot at the rind area just to help make a soft barrier to keep the colors from flooding into each other. And then we're going to do our sap green, and I like to move the smaller brush so I don't get too much paint. And that is going to go right along the edge. And we're going to be glazing over these colors, so if they don't, if the rind is looking too weak, don't worry, we're going to be softening that. Now try not to have your lines as dark as mine are when you transfer because um, that could be a little bit tough to overcome. You might be able to erase it though because we don't have a lot of paint going over it, so that could be helpful. And for just a real soft look here, and then we're going to get another piece of saran wrap. So the only thing you have to really worry about is when you put this down that um, it's not like your, your paint isn't going to follow one of those channels and just, you know, run right off the item that you're painting. So just kind of be aware of that. I like to lay the plastic wrap down and then kind of push in towards the item so that it kind of concentrates that color and it's le less likely to bleed off into something else. Now you will have to kind of peek underneath this to get to the, the, uh, the watermelon below. But that's fine because you can actually lay that wrap down and, and go on top of that. Use some of that on top of the other. But again, same exact technique. We'll go real quick here for this one. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave the just uh, leave them in the comments. Um, but this is a great technique. Anytime you want that icy look, like on a frosted window pane or an icy pond, or um, even if you just want a fun background for a card or an art journal. So while I'm wetting this, I am leaving a little barrier between the uh the edge of this um so i'm not quite wetting up to the edge i'm going like like a 30 second of an inch or something tiny tiny little little barrier of just dry paper because if the paper's dry the paint isn't going to travel the paint is lazy it's only going to go where it's easiest to go and i can probably do both of these at once because 
they're pretty small and it's not a very complicated process. I'm going with our red first. Just be careful on those edges. You can always fill in areas later if we need to. And it might just be a lovely highlight that we don't need to do anything to. Leave that little scant gap there. Little yellow ochre. And it's okay if each one is slightly different because it'll help them stand out from each other. Don't forget your green, but use a littler brush. And if it doesn't seem like you need to uh, to blot between the colors, then then don't bother. But if you see them start to run together, because red and green are going to make brown, then you'd want to go in and blot. And you can also do that with a Q-tip if you're feeling a little clumsy with a paper towel. And then we will use some more plastic wrap. Be careful, the wrap wants to stick to each other too, so <laughs> if they become atta attached, let's see if I can... No, I need another little piece. This is such a fun technique. I use it quite a bit. And this is going to take roughly, well, it depends on where you live. If you live in a hot, dry place, it probably would take like less than an hour. Um, sometimes if you want a really dramatic look, put a book down on it, leave it overnight. Um, maybe put a piece of wax paper down first or something so you don't get your book wet if your paper's really wet. Um, but then you'll have a really dramatic look the next day. But you can really see where all the little chunks of, um, of darker versus lighter areas are going to be. So through the magic of television, I have one already done. Get that turkey out of the oven. I feel like Martha Stewart or Julia Childs or whoever used to do that. And it was Julia Childs. I think it was Julia Childs. And now we'll start working on this. And I'm actually going to start with a background. Um, I'm going to go in with my number 30 round, but you can use a flat. It really does not matter. And I am just going to wet, I think I'll wet above the uh, table line that I put in there on the pattern. I actually measured it and used a ruler because that's one of those things that I tend to like not worry about and then I realized that my table's completely crooked and then when I frame it I have to like put it crooked in the frame <laughs> so it looks like it's straight. I'm going to go around the objects here and you can tip it to the light to see if you've wet everything. I like a round brush just because you can you have the you have the fat belly of the brush that will hold all kinds of water and paint, and then you've got the tip of the brush that can get in all those little details, all the nooks and crannies. Uh, creative Planet Janet, slide, slide cutters come on saran wrap now at the grocery store? Oh, cool. No, it was a question. Oh, um, well, this is the not saran brand. I don't know um, what they have, but I think maybe because it's a larger roll, it's a 300 square foot roll from uh, Walmart, it has the has a slide cutter on it. I had to reinforce my box because I messed it up because you have to put the slide cutter on, which is a technical feat. Um, so I ended up breaking my box, so I had to tape it up because because uh, I messed it up. But, uh, but yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> I really like it. Um, for the color for the background, I'm going to mix. Um, I'm going to do burnt sienna and... Well, I'm going to make a gray. I'm going to start with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. That's going to be kind of like my neutral that I go to uh, throughout the painting. And then I'm also going to be using some of the colors on their own, as well as some yellow ochre, because I want to repeat these colors. And this is a great palette for summer. Um, you might want to add like a, like a Windsor yellow or a lemon yellow or a uh, Hansy yellow light, something to like that to your palette. Um, in addition, because you only have one yellow and it's very warm. Um, but it's a great summertime palette if you just want a limited palette to work with. Now I think I'm going to go right in first with some yellow ochre just to kind of represent the sun and summer and get that in the background. And I'm going to grab a little ultramarine blue. Some of that in there too. It's such a striking color against the watermelon as well. 
I like the feeling of, you know, maybe this uh, arrangement is sitting out on a picnic table, so we've got these sunny and sky colors. And ultramarine blue and yellow ochre do not make a green because the yellow ochre is so warm and um, ultramarine blue is so warm. They are not the blue and yellow that would be near each other on the color wheel making green. They, uh, you'd want a cool green and a cool blue. I mean, a cool yellow and a cool blue to make a nice green. So at the most, they neutralize each other and would get just almost like a khaki gray color. So you don't have to worry about getting a uh, getting green sky by doing this. And plus, ultramarine blue has a beautiful granulation quality that is really pretty in skies, I think. Uh, Pokey, how do I stop my paint from bleeding out under the cling film? Um, by pushing the cling film towards the center of your object, you can kind of guide the um, you can guide the the paint. You could also gently blot your area of the wet paper with a paper towel to get the excess water out, or even just dry your brush off and set your dry brush like in the wet area to soak up any puddles. Um, it could just be that you have it way wetter than I do, and that's making it run out. But I would try not to uh, not to fret about it too much. I'm just going to feather that up into the more yellow area. Just because I don't want it to be like a huge blood, like a splotty yellow and then the rest of it's blue. I want it to be a little more transitioned. And it's a background, so I don't want it to be super dominant. Okay, I think that's going to work just fine. Sometimes if I have trouble with my background blending, I'll give it a pretty aggressive bang against the table and that will kind of jiggle the pigments enough to make them um, kind of behave. Now we can go ahead and work on our smoothie here and I'm going to be mostly using a number eight round and I am going to, um, I think we'll do a controlled wash. I'm going to start with some of the rose red and by the way I, these are the pans that I have in my my box here. This is where I store them, and oftentimes I'll stick the metal pans to the lid of this to use it. But I really love working on ceramic, so I took some poster putty and I stuck it in my palette to hold those in place. The magnets are still on them. The poster putty, the magnets are pushed into the poster putty, um, so that's a nice solution if you um, if you are you know you like to use a ceramic plate or something, but your pans are sliding all over the place. You can use a little poster putty. I'm gonna take a little bit of the yellow ochre, mix it right into that color. And what you want is, um, you want a fairly neutral red, really. So that yellow ochre is kind of taking the pink out of your magenta color, your, your rose red. And you need to have enough that you can paint the entire area with, because we're going to do a technique called a controlled wash. This is one of the techniques that I share in my um, Essential Tools uh, and Techniques for Watercolor Painting class. So if you do want more, um, more help on washes, that's a, that's a good class to try. Um, so I'm going to start by making a bead of my um, my color here at the smoothie line here, the water line, I guess you'd call it, if it was not a smoothie. And I am going to drop color into that and fill it up. So this is nice. This is a nice wash to do when you don't have a super huge area, but it's not super tiny either, and you want a uniform, uh, you want a uniform look. So then what I'm going to do, and I'm holding my paper at an angle, which you can probably see on the, uh, on the video, and I'm just going back and forth, and I'm making sure that I have that bead of, um, of paint there at the end. Now, if it looks like it's drying up, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go until I run out. I'm going to go till the bead is almost used up, and then I'm going to pick up more, keep my paper tilted, and just drop it into that bead. So hopefully you can see there's like this bead of, of color there and you want to keep working you don't want to like let it sit there because if you do then you're going to get some back runs which is like the cauliflower um, effect that you get when you drop paint into a wet wash or like you have a bunch of puddles like around the edge of your painting and you get that kind of um, ruffle along the edge so this is just a, a nice technique and now we probably have enough to, to finish up this so I'm not going to reload the bead because we're almost to the end 
Uh, Abby Earhart, Earhart, how long did it take for the paint to dry before you took the plastic wrap off? Well, I live in Maine where it's fairly damp, so it took me about, I would say, an hour and a half before I took mine off. Okay, when you're at the end, you want to dry your brush off on a paper towel or a rag, whatever you use, and then you want to just kind of go over that last line so you can soak up any puddles. Because if there's a puddle there, when you lay it flat, you're gonna end up with a backwash. <clears throat> but that's how you get a perfectly uniform wash in watercolor. It's a wonderful trick. And now we can, while that's drying, we can work on some of the other parts of the picture. I think I wanna put a little shadow on my straw. Now, the nice thing about the back, well, this is still wet, so I don't wanna do that yet. But the neat thing about the way we painted this, we have a light source. We put that yellow there, that subconsciously tells us the sun's up here, the light's coming from this way. So um, we know our shadows are going to come, they're gonna to go to the left, kind of in front and to the left, just by, by default, since that's where we put our light source. Even if it was just a light, on the wall or on the ceiling coming from that direction it gives us a nice idea of where we're going to put our shading um so i am going to come over here and start on this watermelon in the back and i am going to just first start with the color on its own now the top face of the watermelon is going to be darker so i am first actually let's scrub out some of the rind area because i noticed that um when it was drying I got some color into the area that would be the white of the rind. So you want to you want a dry paper towel and you want a scrubber brush and your scrubber brush should be wet or damp, not sopping, but it's got to be wet enough to scrub. Now your red is going to be a little bit staining, so you probably won't be able to remove it all, but you can lighten up that area. So you just want to scrub back and forth. And if your paper starts to peel, then then stop. You can always go back in with like color pencil or something and, and add some light if you need to. So don't do this if your paper's peeling. And this isn't going to take a ton off uh, anyway, but we can soften things a little bit. And if you do have a brush that works good like this, save it for a scrubber brush. That, that aggressive treatment on a brush that you paint with can be, um, can be a little too harsh for it. I think I'll also see if I can scrub or soften that a little bit of red right up here too. Someone gave me a great tip and unfortunately I did not heat it um, today, but somebody said, because I'd have it stuff sliding around on my table the other day, and they said, get a piece of that, that, that grippy stuff that goes under your carpets or your shelf liner, and put that under your thing and it won't slide around. I wish I had, <laughs> had done that so my stuff was sliding around. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm going to take this, just the red on its own, and I'm going to add some to the face of this watermelon slice. So I can kind of mimic, I can go over some of those textures that the uh, saran wrap made. I'm not, I didn't wet the paper, I'm just kind of adding to what we made for texture with that saran wrap. We'll have to put some seeds in our watermelon too because seeds look cool. And I think I want to put maybe like a, um, uh, like a crack down the watermelon because I think that's kind of visually interesting. So I'm going to kind of sketch it in with my, with my brush here and I'm going to make it go across the face of it, the, uh, the top of it rather. And then I'm going to grab some of that mixed gray that we made and add that into the crack. I just want to make sure there's just some bit of shadow on this, this watermelon. Uh, Parish Riddle, where does the eye go when looking at this piece? I think the focal point will definitely be the, the smoothie when it's all done, but the, but what you want is that you want to kind of travel around and not get stuck anywhere. So um, the rule of thirds, you generally divide up your, your painting into threes this way and threes that way, and you want to put your interesting things on where the lines intersect. So this chunk of watermelon in the straw would be where two lines intersect, then you have the smoothie down here, then you've got this watermelon here, and then um, you've got the kind of the top of that watermelon. So your eyes should actually travel around the picture here. 
I'm going to paint the rind in here and I'm going to use sap green to begin with. And I'm just going to go right on the dry paper. And then while I'm at it with that color on my brush, I can outline and make sure that's nice and crisp because sometimes things get um, a little uh, a little messed up with a saran wrap. It like pushes the paint out a little bit so you can refine. And I think I'll add a little bit of ultramarine to the sap green to add a little bit of shadow here. And I can also go ahead and just trace the edges of these two while I'm at it. I'm using my brush pretty much straight up and down so that I can get that nice sharp line. Now this one you can see the edge of the uh, the rind so I want to go in and just cover that. That's kind of buried. It's going to be a little bit darker. It's hiding in there. So I can stay with that sap green and blue mix. Just bring that around. It helps if you can turn your picture too so that you're pulling a stroke towards you, I think. If you're trying to get a nice fine line. And there, so that's dark, that's lower, it's going to be more shadow. This is a little bit lighter up here. Uh, so you have a little bit of a little bit of a variance in the um, in the colors, which I think looks nice. Now up here you can actually do like the edge here with this darker blue-green mix. Just like this bottom edge, and then I'm gonna switch just to sap green to paint the rest of that rind. I also have two jars of water here. I wash my brush in the bigger one first and then I get fresh water from the smaller one. And that's why I recommend two jars of water in case you're new and you don't quite understand. It seems like a waste. That's, that's why we do that in watercolor. So just the sap green on its own. Hopefully the background is dried enough. If not, we're gonna have some feathering, but I think it looks like it's going to be all right. If not, we'll uh, we'll fix it. It'll be a teachable moment. That's true. Actually, I'm surprised how quickly that's drying up down here. Okay, and I think I'll make it a little bit darker behind this slice here, because that will help push this piece of watermelon back, and it will help the um, the ones in front come forward. I like when the colors kind of meet up there. That looks really natural, how the watermelon looks. And then on the top of the watermelon, I can do just a little bit of, just a little bit of accenting. It's kind of hard to tell what it's gonna look like until it's dry. Your colors can look really dark and um, almost overdone. But then when it dries, it looks fine. So red's one of those tricky colors. It's, it's kind of tough to, um, to kind of visualize sometimes. Okay, we're gonna do the same to the other slices as well. My paint's a little watery actually. I shouldn't have really big beads there. You can use some of that. I just picked up that color that we had made for the smoothie. And that works really well because um, because it, those colors should coordinate. It's a watermelon smoothie there, so we want to have that color in there. I was just thinking about how there's not many seeded fruits anymore. Like most fruits you buy, except for like apples, don't have seeds in them. Really? It's been a long time since I've had an apple. Really? You don't eat apples? Yeah, well, I, apples, well, of course, have their seeds because they have an apple core, yeah. but and you don't eat the core. But, like, um, it seems like most of the citrus and stuff like that, mm. they don't have seeds anymore. Yeah. Well, I stopped eating fruit there when I changed my diet. Yeah. Because any time I would eat fruit, it would be to have a snack, and mm -hmm. I just don't snack anymore. Yeah. I usually follow up my meal with a piece of fruit. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have the urge to, like, for dessert or anything sweet. I, I do still like berries, like strawberries and mm -hmm. blueberries and raspberries. I do love all of those. And now that it's summer, mm. we'll be getting all the fresh stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, Kathy Whitney, what is that thing you have your brush sitting on? Well, let me tell you. This was my DIY of the week. Um, <laughs> well, well, I was really happy with it. I went to, well, I went to the antiques mall and I was looking for um, an old ashtray to buy for a brush rest because I because I have a really bad habit. Sarah can attest to this of leaving my brushes in the water, and so I caught her more than once. Yeah. Reminded her. So and I just I feel so bad when I go down to my studio in the morning and I realize I've left a brush in overnight and the handles all swelled and my paints cracked and um, so I got this brush rest well this little dish because I didn't have any cool ashtrays so but I did find this set of two little dishes like this for a dollar twenty five and I tinted them with alcohol ink and um, so they look kind of pretty and vintage. And I have one downstairs for my brushes and one upstairs for my brushes. So, and the little ridges on the edge of the brushes on the edge of the dish keep my things from um, rolling off, and I can keep my credit card scraper or sponge or anything else I need in there. So, and I inked it from the bottom so I can wash out the inside if I need to, like if it got paint on it or whatever. So it's just wonderful, and it's I mean, you can go to Goodwill or Salvation Army and find little dishes like that for nothing, pretty much. And they're just it's so handy, and I just think it's kind of fun because it's you know it's old and reused and kind of neat I think they are neat I like and affordable because you can yes. go to any thrift store yeah absolutely they always have that or a yard sale yep. you know buy buy a couple for you know you can run yeah. it four for a dollar probably probably a dollar store is something similar but you want something with the ridges on the edge so that it'll keep your brushes from fall, from uh, rolling off that's why I was thinking an ashtray but I like this even better um, so I'm going to take that gray that I mixed, and remember that was ultramarine blue and um, burnt sienna. And I'm going to do a little bit of a shadow on the side of the straw, but I don't want much. So I'm loading up my brush. Look how inky this is. I'm going to move it up to the camera. It's like it's like water. There's very little pigment in there. See how inky? And I'm going to blot my brush so I don't get too much. And I tend to blot the belly of the brush, so that just kind of keeps you from getting a big like um, amount of water you're not used to and I'm going to apply this to the um, to the left side the side away from the Sun here and it's really faint and I'm not going to do a lot I'm just going to do and you probably can't even see it on camera because it's just very very faint but it's just a little shadow on the side maybe you can see that and I could um, I can even go within the jar and do a little bit of that um, but I don't want to necessarily keep it too pristine in the jar like I'd put more shadow right underneath the uh, watermelon because that would block a lot of the light and then just kind of just tap on some of that gray because everything gets distorted when it's in glass if it's not pressed up against the glass like our smoothie it's going to be distorted so we want to make sure that we have that represented oh and that smoothie's already dry okay but we're still going to keep working on the watermelon we're going to finish that up and then we'll we'll uh, go on to other stuff uh, same with that smoothie color. We are going to get this edge. Uh, the reference photos are available on my blog, and I did put a link to that post in the um, in the video description. At least I, I put it in there. Hopefully, I saved it after I put it in there. Um, but if not, just go to my blog, and it's right there. In that post on the top. Um, and let's see. I think we'll make some seeds because. They're visually appealing. And this was my husband's idea to paint watermelon today. So. We were having a discussion. Uh, several people in chat put salt on their watermelon. Really? Some people told, uh, some, my, you know, May May from May May Made It channel. Uh, her and her husband, they put, they put salt on peaches. Which, because I'd done a painting of a peach and, and, her, and her husband said, oh, I'm going to go get my salt shaker. And I'm like, salt shaker? And they, and they say, yeah, we put salt in the peaches in the, in the south. I thought that was really interesting. That is interesting. Um, so I am going to just kind of make up where I'm going to put the, the the seeds because there aren't a lot of seeds in the reference photos that I have. Um, and I think that actually needs to be a little bit darker. So this is too watery for the dark mix that I want. So I'm just going to go in a fresh area here. I'm going to grab some burnt sienna right off the pan. I don't want to add extra water if I can help it. Rinse off the color and blunt my brush so I don't pick up any more water than I need to. Grab my ultramarine. There, we almost want a, um, uh, almost like a, gosh, I don't know what to compare this to. It's like a thicker, it's a thicker paste that we're making of the color. Uh, Pokey, could I put a ruler beside the straw to paint the line? I have poor equilibrium, so I can't paint a straight line. Yeah, or a piece of masking tape, but maybe stick it to your clothing first to make sure it doesn't, it's not too sticky. 
Oh, watch out for this. I don't know if you can see this. I've got a bead of water right on the edge of my ferrule there. If that slides down when I'm trying to paint those seeds, it is going to make a mess of my painting. So you always want to kind of keep your eye on the ferrule. And if you see a bead of water, just stop what you're doing and clean it off before it causes any trouble. So your, your seeds can be just a, just a little slice, like a sliver like that, or it can be like a skinny teardrop. They generally will point towards the center. So if you have them on a wedge, they usually will point towards the point of your wedge, or if you've got a semicircle, they're gonna point into the middle of that semicircle. Um, just, um, just that's the way they grow. I, I don't. And a lot of times, if you have a, if you have wedges, you'll just have like on the sides, you'll just see a line, and then when you're on the face of the watermelon, you get more of that teardrop. One of my fondest memories of a child is my. Um, my grandfather had a sweet tooth and he would get a watermelon and he would um you would put me on one knee and my cousin ernie in the other and give us each a spoon he just cut a, sli a slice that watermelon half. right in half and and uh and we would eat watermelon i can't do melon it makes it gives me like terrible burps for hours after and they taste moldy oh my gosh and my stomach does I my I can't I can't do watermelon, cantaloupe, honeydew, none of that. Wow. Like it just my stomach you is You must like, have like an allergy to it or something. I guess. I don't know. It's the only thing that it does. Which is fine. I was never a huge fan of, you know, watermelon or melons in general, so yeah. You can put as many seeds as you want to, so that's completely up to you. You don't have to have them if you don't want them. And I'm going to do a couple just like little slices, just little slivers up here, just because you wouldn't really have, you wouldn't really see the whole seeds. You could put some ants on there, I guess, if you wanted to. You could. You I don't want ants on mine. <laughs> protein, right? Ooh. <laughs> That's not vegan. <laughs> Um, so we get some little mint leaves up here. We can go ahead and paint those in. I'm going to use sap green with a little bit of ultramarine to cool it down, darken it up a little bit. And, ooh, I am going to, um, I'm using a small brush just because mine is drawn pretty small, but you could use a bigger brush if you have a little more space. Just make sure your sky is dry. My sky is pretty dry. It still feels cool to the touch with the back of my hand. Um, you know, I probably should just stop and dry that. If you guys have any questions, um, type them into chat. I'm going to dry that. It'll just take me about 30 seconds, but I'll take a question or two while I'm doing that, if anybody has any. And I'll go ahead and dry everything at this point, because I might as well, since I have the heat tool out. Before I taped my paper down. Oh, by the way, this is a tip I want to share. When you uh, are done with a block of watercolor paper, it comes on such nice, um, nice material. It comes on such a hard backed um, cardboard that I recommend saving that and taping your loose sheet watercolor paper down to it. And then you've got the flap that comes with the block to protect it. You can like close it up when you're not if you're still working on a painting to keep it nice and safe. So. We'll reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle tip. Here we go. Boy, the, the, no questions today. We must have... People have are talking about watermelon and salt. <laughs> um, if you want to do this with a bigger brush, um, I recommend trying to do it with one stroke if you can. Just kind of press your brush in there and push and lift. And you'll get a nice, um, you get a nice shaped petal. You have to be careful if you're up against something though, because it can be difficult to um, to control that stroke if you're right up against a straw or what have you. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at the glass here and see what colors I see reflected in it. Um, I'm gonna blot my brush a little bit. I know I had some green, so I'm gonna go ahead and put some little bits of green reflecting in my glass. When you're doing clear glass, you're not really painting the glass, you're painting everything um, that's reflecting the glass. 
And I'm also going to get some, a little bit of ultramarine blue. Really, really watery though. And that would be kind of the sky color and um, <clears throat> some of the background color. I'm going to get some of that smoothie color. Move my palette back around. I'm going to keep it lighter up here because it's not pressed against the glass. The part we're seeing is the is the, like the top of the smoothie. So. And some of that color can also be picked up in the threads of the mouth of the jar. If you feel like your, your mix is too watery, just, just touch your brush on a paper towel and that will help it. You'll still keep the color on your brush, but it will help kind of soften it and keep it from running too much. And try to keep a little, um, just a little hair of, of highlight there where the the top of the smoothie line is so that you, you don't have to go back in with a um, with a pen or anything. And I'm gonna leave that to dry and then I might come back with another layer of stuff later if I feel like it needs it. Um, now I want to work on the ground a little bit and um, you could do all sorts of table tablecloth ideas. Uh, the reference photo that I had that had the drinks and it actually had kind of like a like a plank type style. Um, I think that would look kind of cool, kind of like a picnic table, but I don't want them coming this way the way they were in the reference photo because it can be very difficult to get several planks to agree perspective wise. And if you're just kind of looking over a picnic table, I think it will look really awkward. So I'm actually going to do my planks in a, um, in a horizontal fashion. And I'm going to start by kind of wetting an area just to get some shadows in front of these watermelon slices. So the green should be dry by now. And I'm just going to wet the area in front of these objects so that I can put in a little bit of a shadow first. I'm going to keep it like whitewash pretty much because I really don't want to, I don't want to distract from the picture that I have here. Then I'm going to pick up that gray that we mixed early on when I said get that neutral ready to go, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna if you haven't mixed it. And I am going to add that underneath our watermelon here into the front because remember our light source is up in the corner and behind um, behind our watermelon so everything the shadows are going to come forward and they're also going to come out to the left because the lights to the right so the light is light, light beams are going in this way and since that the edge of that watermelon is up in the air I don't want to I want to leave a little bit of light underneath it that we can see from behind it because it wouldn't have a shadow behind it. Make sure you don't have any puddles because puddles will turn into cauliflowers. Blooms is a technical term. And I'm also going to wet um, this little section right here and uh, over here a little bit. You want to make sure you wet beyond where your shadow is going to be. So that way you've got plenty of room for that uh, paint to spread and soften out. And our mix is very watery, so we're not going to end up with a huge concentration of uh, pigment. Now this little triangle will probably be the darkest shadow area because it's clustered. A lot of light's being blocked there. I pretty much just drip the paint in up against the darkest area and let it float. Okay, we'll let that dry. So while that's drying, we can go ahead with the um, crimson or the rose red on its own and paint the stripes on our straw. Watch out for beads on your brush. And make sure your paint's not too wet because you don't want it to go outside of the lines. I'm gonna turn my painting upside down for this so that I don't drag my hand into something that's wet. And I am going to start with the top section being a red stripe. I wouldn't worry about the ellipse on your straw uh, just because it's small. I don't really think that 
you know, depending on how the straw is tipping, uh, it doesn't have to agree with the jar or anything else in the picture. Uh, Abby Ar Ar Earhart, what do you mean by cauliflower? Um, it's a little bloom that happens when you um, when you have a, a set, like a puddle of paint. The uh, puddle, the water pushes all the pigment to the outside of the puddle, and then you end up with this hard pigment line. It looks like a cauliflower. No, I've got a really wet leaf there, so I've got to be really careful as I paint near it. So I'm just smoothing out what I have there, trying to bring it up close to the leaf as I can without touching it, because I can see that I have a lot of paint. I have kind of like a bead of, of paint in that leaf that I don't want it to... I don't want them to mingle. I just want to start a little stripe right there, just kind of give a hint of it. But again, I've got those those wet leaves, so I've got to be careful. And I, that's that stripe's way too close to the other ones, but you know what? It's fine. <laughs> No worries. There was a misprint at the factory where they came from. That was the, that straw from the dollar store. <laughs> That's what you get for a dollar. The paint, the stripes aren't perfect. Yeah. And then you can be real messy uh, inside the jar because things will be distorted. That straw's gonna bug me. <laughs> Where's my whiteout? <laughs> Where's my gel pen? Yeah, <laughs> this is, we're gonna we're gonna do some gel pen on this. Okay, now our round is almost dry, um, and I'm gonna figure out where I want my planks to be. And I think I may actually go to a liner brush for this. Um, I don't have any really long area to paint, so actually I probably don't need to, but if you had a larger area, you could definitely do a, a uh, liner brush. I think I might actually use that ruler idea that that our friend just shared with us. Whoa. Oh, sorry for that, guys. I just like totally bumped my head into the stick that hangs from my ceiling that holds my, <laughs> my camera. This is a real uh, professional outfit we run here. We got a stick on the ceiling. This is high end. <laughs> high end. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to try this. We'll see how it works. Um, so I'm just going to go up against this ruler and see how I can, how this will work. You could slide, oh, when oh. you're done painting, just a little over towards the palette there. Yeah, it's kind of tricky to figure out when you're, where your, where your bristles are going to stop. That's kind of a neat trick, actually. Oh yeah, that looks pretty good. I like that. We could have them like a ruler width apart or something, and then that would spacing, spacing wise, be all right. Maybe I'll give us like a ruler and a quarter of an inch. I was keeping the weirdest thing. I had one of these rulers, but it was like so old, and all the numbers were, were worn off. But I was still keeping it, and like I found another one, and I was still keeping this ruler with the, all the numbers rolled off. And I'm like, seriously, a ruler has one job: throw away the ruler that doesn't have the numbers on it. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. Why? Am I? So I'm like, well, I can use it to cut things against. You know, I'm justifying keeping that. It's like, that's crazy. Get rid of the get rid of the ruler with no numbers. That's right. Not helpful. No. Uh, Sarah Morrissey, I bought a cheap set of Reeves watercolors. I've been hearing so much about light fastness, and I've made some gifts with this paint. Do you have experience with Reeves? Yeah, you know, they're not bad. They, um, I'm not sure if they're still um, made by the company that makes Windsor & Newton. Um, I'm sh you know, if you're putting them, if you're going to frame them under glass, I think they're going to be pretty, uh, pretty good. I'm trying to think if I have any... Uh, any paintings still out in circulation that I've done with Reeves because uh, I used to teach with that paint a lot uh, my, ch my students my children's students and I never really had an issue I don't think that they're gonna fade like over the next 25 years you probably have like you know I would say if you framed it you put it under glass you should have probably 25 years with them anyway and the earth tones if you use a lot of earth tones those should be fine regardless I'm taking a little watery yellow ochre and adding some highlights to the tops of the planks here. Give it that summer glow. I 
I mean, because Windsor and Newton made Reeves, I don't think they would make a really, a really untrustworthy paint. I'm going to take a little bit of that yellow ochre and also add some into this jar. And I can even add a little bit of that on the edge of the straw that's, um, that's facing the sun. Just a little bit. Okay, I feel like the shadows on the watermelon should be a little bit more distinct. And that feels dry enough to go ahead and darken them up a little bit. I'm gonna stay with that small brush. This is a number two round. We had somebody asking about the size of the paper you're using. You cut it down from a full sheet, so it would be... Um, this is, uh, I would say eight and a half by 11, because yeah. I tore it I tore it down. Um, it's like a little bit more than an eighth of a sheet. I, I think that's the most economical way to buy your paper in the full sheets, if you have space to store it, but it is a little bit of a of a hassle like to, to tear it down. But if you don't mind doing that, then it's a great way to buy it. Then you have whatever size you want. Blocks are super convenient, but you pay a price for that convenience. So when I'm going here and adding a darker shadow, a lot of times I'll go in with one brush and I'll add it, and then I'll take another brush that's just damp and clean, and I will just hit the edges and spread it out a little bit. Uh, Deb Smith, what type of light do you use when not videotaping? Um, I use the same lights, but I don't have as many on. So it's like a, it's a daylight, either LED or daylight um, CFL, and they're in um, they're in clamp lights from the hardware store. Abby Earhart, I just filled a DIY palette with Reeves, and it cracked and came out. The same thing started to happen with my koi watercolors. Any tips to prevent cracking and how to fix it? Yep, add some glycerin to it. You can get that at the pharmacy. If you can't find glycerin, you can also add honey to it. Just make sure you're not someplace where you've got like bees or ants um, that might, you know, think they're in for a tasty treat there. Glycerin is my favorite. I use that for a lot of different art, so art hacks. I have a whole video on glycerin if you want other ideas for it before you buy a bottle. It's not crazy expensive. I think it's about $4 a bottle at Walmart mm -hmm. um, in the pharmacy section. Or I, I usually get it at the health food store because I can use it in candy making. And I think it's like $8, but it's a bigger bottle. I am just, you know, deepening up shadows until I feel like I have them dark enough. I want to do some texture on the planks. Um, I have to be careful not to bump into anything while I'm doing that, but I think it would be nice to have a little bit of a wood grain texture and also maybe to bring in a little more color so you kind of get that shabby chic, like peeled, old peeled paint look. And a, a brush that's really great for that is just an old hog fan brush if you happen to have one. You can grab one out of your um, acrylic painting stash if you have some from acrylic painting. and. They're just, you know, really great for doing textury effects. So I'm just gonna pick up some of that color that I have. It's gonna be fairly inky because it has to come off the bristles. And you can have a little more blue in it. So it's a ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. I'm just adding a little more blue to help um, brighten it up. And I think I'll put some yellow ochre in there to give it a little more body because yellow ochre is a more opaque color. Even the Turner yellow ochre, I believe it's a synthetic yellow ochre. Actually, it might not be. I thought we saw it was a synthetic one, but it says PY43, and I believe that's the iron pigment. But it is a very clean yellow ochre. Um, so it's a pretty yellow ochre. And I'm just going to dry brush some texture onto the boards here. It's always a little scary when you first do it because you've got these pristine white areas, and then you're adding this texture to it. Uh, Sharon Egolf, when will you be teaching at the Bangor Library? I don't teach at the Bangor Library, I teach at the Orrington Library, um, and it's monthly. If the Bangor Library would like to book me for a class, they are more than welcome to contact me through the contact form on my website. <laughs> I would not rule it out. Creative Planet Janet, I am looking for different paint pans. 
I don't really care for the little rectangle ones. I want separate ones with slanted bottoms. Do these exist? Not that I know of. I would recommend you buy a palette that has the wells like that. You can, you can add your paint to the palette at a slant um, if you want to. Just kind of put it in, put your paint in. Well, let me grab one that's not stuck down. Put your paint in, just fill it halfway, like up to the edge, and just kind of like wet your finger and then push it so you get that slant of paint, if that's what you want to do. Um, or take your favorite colors and put them in a permanent palette that has, that has slanted wells. Okay, now I think I'll go in and put some cracks in some of these boards where I think, like, maybe I'll put a knot here because uh, I'll just look at, like, the way that I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll look at how my dry brushing went and if anything looks like, kind of like a big, like a splop or something that I don't like or it doesn't look like just weathered wood, I'll turn that into a knot and then just kind of make some little line work around it. And I can put in some little hairline uh, cracks, you know, where I was too shy to get next to items that I didn't want to like mess up. Can just add little nail holes and stuff like that, give it some texture. Okay, so now I'm going to do um, another layer on the watermelon. And this is one of these things that you can just kind of fuss with as much or as little as you want. I just want to make sure this has some three dimensions, so I want to put a little bit of uh, color on the face of this because it would be a little bit darker than the top, which would have light reflecting. So I'm just using my smaller brush because as you, you know, you work through a painting, the, as you refine it, you want your brushes to kind of get a little smaller so that you're not, uh, you can't over affect your painting. You're just like adding details and highlights and shadows. And if you go too far, you haven't gone too far. So if you're not quite sure where to quit and you think, oops, I just went a little too far. You could stop yourself before it gets out of hand. And I look for places where the saran wrap made interesting shapes and I just darken those, sh those shapes and that's how I kind of go about using that saran wrap as a guide. But the saran wrap does so much of the work that you really don't need to, um, you don't need to do a ton. Just want to make sure you have that dimension. You can also put like some darker area of the red around the seeds because there's usually like a little hollow if you see a seed. And it can be to either side. And I'm alternating between the smoothie color and the color on the, um, they're just the red on its own. Oh, I am mumbling. No wonder nobody could hear me. <laughs> Gee, Louise, my first day on the job. And you can also suggest where seeds would be. If it was a seedless watermelon, you could just do little dabs that way. You can sharpen anything. Like if you left a gap and you didn't like it, you could paint over it and you'll still end up with a highlight there. I think I can bring that out. And just a little bit up here. I'm just going to go straight with the rose red because it's a nice fresh clean color and I felt like this was getting a little too muddy. And I can put a little bit of that color right underneath these uh, some straw and the mint leaves to help park it up a little bit. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit stronger with my color in the top of the smoothie here where you'd see the the top section of the drink. Get some reflections in there. Can add some gray, some of mixed gray, which is the ultramarine blue and burnt sienna for some really strong refractions. Uh, those would go 
Um, I would do those like right near the, uh, the threads. And it really does sharpen everything up. So any color that you've used is fair game when you're putting these reflections. add a little bit to the edges and that way if your controlled wash got a little bumpy on the edge that happens sometimes the um, putting that shadow at the edge where you see you're peering through the layers of glass on the side uh, that's where you, that's why you get that little bit of a of a refraction and it doesn't just look like the smoothie color because you've got you are actually looking through a couple layers of glass And I'm gonna go in with some of the rose red and just add some kind of reflections. Actually, maybe go with a, with a flat brush for that. I wanna add a reflection from the watermelon on the side of the, of the jar there. I think this would be a good brush to do that with. So I want the, uh, the paint to be loose enough that it'll come off my brush, but I don't wanna have like a big, I don't wanna have a bead of color there. Uh, I'm gonna just, Maybe I'll start it at the waterline and just kind of pull it straight down. Pull about there because there is like a little bit of a ridge. Put a little bit over there. It's going to dry more subtle, so don't worry if it looks a little bit, a little bit too bold. It'll dry. Uh, Janie subtly. Lewis, if I had a bike bite mark taken out of the watermelon, should I paint all the way to the edge or leave some white space for reflection? Um, reflection on the jar, if she had a bite mark on that watermelon? She just said watermelon, she didn't say which one. Um, if you, I think if you had a bite mark on this, you wouldn't really notice it in the reflection of the jar. If you did like a bite mark on that, you just want to make sure that you're seeing that you have background showing through the bite mark so that you don't just have white, you want to have whatever you have in the background behind it. If that doesn't, if I didn't catch that question right, just go ahead and repeat it. I think that's what she meant. Like maybe you'd have space behind it. I don't think because because it's so distorted when you have the um, the glass, you wouldn't really see any clear ref reflection from that. And I'm going to just grab a little yellow ochre, and I'm going to hit the glass with a little bit of that. just a little bit sneaking around from the back. Maybe a little bit with some ultramarine blue on its own. It's a little too watery there. I uh, just want to get some of that in there from the background. And I'm going to just hit this with a dryer so we can see how it looks all dry. But I think I'm going to leave it the way it is. I think I'm pretty happy with the way this looks. Um, you can always go over and do some other stuff on top. Or I could go in and grab a little, like, a pastel or watercolor crayon and brighten up the rind if the guys want to see that. The reds really mellow when they dry, so I wanted to make sure the reflections on here were dry so they could see that. All right, do we have any other questions or anything? Uh, we're all caught up. All right, should I do the white on the rind, do you think, with the crayon, or? Sure, show people. Yeah, why not? Let me wipe Especially off. since there won't be a video next week. That's right, because I will be on the road. You'll be, you'll be teaching classes. Yes, and you'll be celebrating your birthday. I know. Many happy returns. Well, you know, the big 39. Oh, wow, next year. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it's not so 39 bad. all over again. I know. 
this is it. This is all you get. Yeah, this is, I'm done <laughs> aging after this. I always think you're way younger than me. You're only a couple of years younger than me. I know. It's because we're both so young at heart. Yes. I'm just going to actually spread that uh, crayon with a scrubber brush because I don't want to add a bunch of water to it. But a watercolor crayon is very much like gouache. Um, it's almost like gouache in a stick, really. Uh, it's got a really smooth, creamy, waxy quality to it, but it, it essentially will work about the same way. I want to make sure I don't have a hard edge, so I did clean off the brush, and I'm just going to soften here so I've got half on, half of my scrubber on the crayon, half on the watercolor. I'm just softening that a little bit there. I'm going to add a little yellow ochre to that because it's a little too cool. So by adding a little yellow ochre, it's going to look a little more natural. And I think that is it. Any questions before we sign off, Sarah? We are all caught up. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for um, for tuning in today. This is a lot of fun. I will take a picture of this and upload it to my blog this afternoon. So if anybody needs that to look, look at, they can. And there's also the reference photo and pattern there if they need it. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this tutorial. It really helps my channel grow. Share it with a friend if you think somebody else would enjoy my tutorials too. I want to thank Jerry's Autorama for sponsoring this video. You can find all the supplies I used linked up in the video description. And uh, have a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. Because a lot of people have long weekends. They do, yes. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Uh, big thanks to Sarah for moderating and all the other moderators in the chat. They are appreciated as always. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Or in West Springfield if you happen to go to the show. <laughs> <laughs> have a great day and a great weekend. Happy crafting.